Um, there is the, again, that sort of natural attrition of, I don't have a whole lot of 90 plus year old fans because there are a whole lot of 90 plus year olds. So, you know, it's that kind of thing. You're going to be losing audience one way or another. Either people lose interest, they don't go out anymore, or they, they die. So. Right, but you, you know, you can curate it yourself and bring and choose the acts that you'd like to bring on. And well, that's what I mean. I always make an attempt to absorb new music, not just because it interests me to do that, but because I realize unless I make a concerted appeal to newer audience all the time, my audience will just shrink down to literally nothing at a certain point. So I think it's important for artists at least to try, make some attempt to try to appeal to other age groups as well but i think that even as listeners people are not as compartmentalized as one might assume and so if you get a lot of good acts and it doesn't matter what age they are what genre they're playing that you can have a lot of fun on a cruise discovering music that you had not heard of before and lending support to you know, a broader range of artists rather than just you know people from the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, that sort of thing. And for yourself, how do you go about seeking out new music? Are you just uh, like a Pandora guy or uh, you know, online or you some eclectic radio stations? You just still go to, you know, try to find a mom and like the, shop? the YouTube method, mm -hmm. you know, YouTube has, um, you go to a YouTube link and then there's the sidebar with all of these somewhat related mm -hmm. things. And so if I'm doing some musical research, I'll ask the youngest person I know, which is my 20 some year old son, what are you listening to? What are the kids into? What should I check out? And he'll give me a name or a couple of names, something like that. And I'll go to YouTube and I'll check that out. But then there's the sidebar and I'll say, oh, that looks interesting over there. And you know, a half a dozen clicks later, you're in a completely different place, listening to a completely different kind of music. But uh, it's a good way to discover what's going on in the kind of like the the nether reaches of the music business that don't always break through to the mainstream. And once things break through the mainstream, you just can't make them stop for some reason. I've never heard a Cardi B song in my life, and yet. Cardi B is in my freaking Apple news feed every morning. I'm wondering what this is about. So I suppose I could listen to a Cardi B song, but I did I did hear one when she played on Saturday Night Live. I don't remember a thing about it, mm -hmm. but it she played it and I listened. But you know. so you know, that's an option, but um, are there any uh, particular artists today that uh, have piqued your interest? Uh, any, can you name one or two that you... Oh yeah, Lemon Twigs. <laughs> Yay, Lemon Twigs. Um, there's a lot of you know interesting artists out. The funniest thing to me is the is that whole Greta Fan Fleet um, brouhaha that's going on about this young band who's who they call the new Led Zeppelin. I think principally just because the lead singer has a real high voice like Robert Plant and he smiles a lot and has curly hair. Um, uh, but they, you know, they like, they were the big hit at the Grammys and that sort of thing. So it's just interesting that uh, everyone makes these constant Led Zeppelin references to them. And so as much as you might have heard about their music, you hear more about the uh, the controversy, you know, are they the saviors of rock and roll right. just because they sound like Led Zeppelin? And um, I just think it's great that uh, that a young band like that can can foment that kind of argument for a bunch of old people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who remembers Led Zeppelin and suddenly are making comparisons to this real young band. But, you know, that is kind of a case in point. If you just, if you don't start thinking in terms of, you know, who had a hit record in the 60s or who had a hit record in the 70s, but more in terms of the kinds of music that you like to listen to and pay less attention to who's playing it, then you start to discover 
you know, do acts that can hold your interest. Yeah. And putting on your producer's hat, is there anybody out there that you'd love to be able to work with? Uh, some some of the newer artists I'm saying. Well, there's um, there's always some interesting acts, but as I say, the music business is not in a particularly healthy place at this point because music has become so much uh, an aspect of personal marketing. Uh, people are not solely musicians; they are influencers. Uh, you have to pay attention to what they're wearing and the stupid things they tweet and all of this stuff and like I say I know all of this stuff about Cardi B I don't know any of her music and so uh, the music business has kind of been in, in a certain way corrupted by this idea that music is not enough you know that you also have to have you know, a bunch of shenanigans, pick a fight with somebody else in the music business and have an ongoing feud with them, you know, or uh, or wear something really ridiculous on a red carpet somewhere. Uh, the music just doesn't seem good enough to hold people's attention nowadays. And that's, I guess, what makes a band like Greta Van Fleet interesting, you know, is because they haven't done enough yet to be distracting from their music. Mm -hmm. They mostly are getting attention for what they play. Right. And uh, that's kind of how it should be. Yeah, and uh, with some artists coming out saying, you know, rock is dead and stuff, and uh, like you said, yeah, some of them, <coughs> people looking towards them as being the saviors or it will continue for a while longer. Yeah, so. and then their second album come on and everybody will crap on it. And then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Sophomore jinx. Right, right. Do you think Todd Rungren would have uh, made it if you were starting out today? Uh, made it, but I don't know yeah. what making it is yeah. in, the, in, in these terms. When I first started out, of course, I was in a band called the Naz, and the Naz didn't take off the way we wanted. Um, the band only lasted maybe 18 months before like the interpersonal tensions and stuff made it impossible for us to go on and at that point I felt like anonymity was as good as anything as long as I could be in the studio making records and in those days that was more of a, a, a privilege and a skill you had to develop because the equipment was expensive and and uh, and time uh, uh, renting time in a studio was very expensive and so you had to be efficient while you were in there and I learned how to do those things. Uh, nowadays, I wouldn't have the same kind of opportunities as a producer as I did then because uh, the expense of making records has gone down significantly. Anyone who can afford a laptop and a little bit of auxiliary equipment can start making their own records, and some extremely successful artists, that's exactly what they've done. Well, yourself included, too. I mean, that's um, how you told me you worked on yeah, the last one. I, I did do that, and that part would be more accessible, certainly to me, as much as anyone else. But I wouldn't have had the advantage that I had then of being an artist who also knew how to engineer and produce records. Uh, it's more commonplace now for an artist to be able to um, to interact and integrate with other artists. It's a lot more um, uh, hybridized nowadays. Um, but trying to make comparisons between what was going on in the music business then and what's going on in the music business now brings in all kinds of other weird aspects. The fact that when I was first in the music business, it was a product business. You sold pieces of plastic. Now everything's become more ephemeral. You can't find a record store anymore. You know, you have to download everything. And so that whole transition just changed the economics uh, it destroyed a lot of big established record labels because they couldn't figure out how to adapt um, to that sort of change. And so it was more than just you know the evolution of music or even the evolution of technology. It's the evolution of the way people consume music that changed completely. Right. And so the, uh, the album artist, I have been traditionally an album artist. I think in album concepts 
and that's not what people buy anymore. People buy a song at a time, and download a song in the songs they like, and artists have, have conformed to that now. Artists don't as often like make a whole album, withhold the whole thing and release it. They're dribbling out music all the time. And, um, and I can do that, but to fully adapt to that, it's, um, maybe I'm too old at this point, I still think in terms of these larger musical concepts and sitting down and listening to a whole record from beginning to end and just immersing yourself in the experience. Um, as opposed to using the music as background to some other activity. And I guess it will always be that sort of division of, you know, of labor amongst artists, artists who uh, are there to entertain you to whatever degree you're willing to be entertained. And then there'll be artists who demand something of you. They demand your time and attention if you want to get um, the full appreciation of what they're trying to do. And I guess I've been mostly the latter. Um, and the fact that production has changed, they say there's a much more self-production. I have to play live more than I used to. I would formally play maybe four, maybe six months out of the year. And the rest of the time I would spend making records. Now I have to tour anywhere from eight to 10 months a year. and fit in the record making in the spaces in, in there or take a big break at some point, you know, make a record and then go back to the routine of playing live. But it's not something that, there's no point in complaining about it, that's, you know, historically what a musician's life is, is playing for people live and the rest of it is advertising for that. In other words, all of the shenanigans that people the Cardi B shenanigans and stuff like that, that's all meant ultimately to sell concert tickets, which would be the measure of your success. And then once you've managed to um, attract enough Twitter followers, you know, sell enough concert tickets, then you start making money by endorsing other people's products, which has become a significant part of a modern artist's um, income stream. Well, to that end, um, we've got the Individualist Tour, the book hybrid concert tour, through uh, uh, almost the third week into March, uh, May, I'm sorry. What's what's beyond that then for you? Uh, uh, more tour plans for the year? Are you looking to record again? What's Well, I'm always recording. I'm still somewhat in a white knight mode in that I'm doing collaborations with uh, a lot of other artists I've got a few in the can and we're trying to figure out how we want to release them, whether we want to put them out as individual songs and then compile them later or whether do it all as an, uh, as an album release. I've got um, songs with Neil Finn from uh, Crowded House is now playing with um, Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac. Uh, Rivers Cuomo from Weezer, we've got uh, a couple artists that uh, people may not have heard of. I'm also doing something with Steve Vai, with, uh, I've got other names that I haven't started with, but I've spoken with them and they're willing to entertain uh, doing a collaboration. So I'm still somewhat in collaborative mode, but I think after a, another year of this, I'll probably have to come up with a concept of some kind yeah. and do another concept record. And then more dates after the book tour too? Will you uh, there will be more dates throughout the summer and then we're also speculating, although we're still in the planning phases of doing a, an original work, original musical work that will be premiered in uh, Amsterdam and streamed live, uh, just, uh, not just uh, audio and not just video, but we're exploring the possibility of doing a VR VR and AR components to it, which means that uh, if AR, augmented reality, that means that you can bring the artist into your environment. Like if you have your iPad and, and everything set up properly for an AR experience, I could be dancing on your coffee table. Wow. And then there's the, the full VR experience in which you get transported into the environment that I create. For that you need like the 
you know, the Apple headphones, right, headphones yeah. and that sort of thing. So we're exploring the possibility of presenting the uh, presenting the production in those formats as well. So that's why it's a little bit hazy right now exactly what we're doing because there's a, a lot of technology involved. Never a dull moment with you, is there? <laughs> you need anybody to watch the house in Hawaii while you're out for nine, ten months? I'll go take care of it for you. No problem. <laughs> house sitting, a little Airbnb. Is that yeah, 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 why not? And then uh, the last thing, um, uh, um, just uh, you familiar with this for your? your oh yeah. Yes. Why don't we talk a little bit about this and then? Uh, well, this uh, um, I don't know whether all of you have heard. Uh, uh, we've also been doing Spirit of Harmony events during the cruise. Uh, we don't necessarily integrate it into every single thing that I do, but it is uh, an important thing for us. The Spirit of Harmony essentially is a foundation that we created about five years ago um, for the purpose of advocating for music education in public school. Uh, So much. It all started with uh, an event that we had in the New Orleans area five years ago. Uh, it was still uh, not too long after Katrina, and uh, the fans wanted to do something for the city, so we found a, a music program in the Lower Ninth Ward who had lost uh, instruments and, and facilities and stuff, and everybody collected money together and we gave them a big uh, novelty check for $10,000. And everyone got such a warm, fuzzy feeling from the experience that they said, let's make this something more permanent. And so that was essentially the idea that started uh, Spirit of Harmony. And then we thought, what is our mission? And after doing some research, realized that there is there's new data that's uh, a new research that is <clears throat> highlighting other aspects of what um, music education can do for a person, particularly in terms of processing sound. And if you take uh, some music lessons when you're young, when the, especially when the brain is very plastic and it's still trying, it's still like forming its neural pathways and and figuring out how to process the data that goes into it. If you um, impose that sort of order that music education gives, um, then it changes the way that you process sound. It gives you, for instance, the ability to pick a single person's vo voice out in a noisy room, because instead of hearing sound as just a blur of, uh, of elements, uh, a musician hears the individual things that are inside a musical performance. And that kind of being able to deconstruct sound gives you advantages that apply not just to music, but to other things in your life. Uh, it's especially effective for disadvantaged kids who come to school with problems to start with, educational problems to start with because of poor nutrition, because of unstable home environments, and things like that. The music education, early music education, can help them catch up to other students who do have the advantages of proper nutrition and stable environments and things like that. So it's not just simply all of the things that everyone already believes about music, that it's an opportunity for kids to work together. It keeps them out of trouble. It helps them focus on something that they enjoy doing. Uh, beyond that, it actually changes their brains and gives them uh, educational advantages that are lifelong. So that's why we believe it's important not just simply for kids to have music education, but it should be a regular part of an early education curriculum. Mm -hmm. we, create, um, we created a space on the internet where you can find resources to make that argument. And in lieu of being able to um, get a program started in your own school, there are always lots of little independent programs who are trying to meet the need, especially in low-income neighborhoods. And so we encourage people to discover what they are through our site and potentially do volunteer work 
We do instrument drives, collect instruments, get them refurbished and put them in the hands of kids who can't afford them. So this particular thing here I think is, a, is an item, a limited edition lithograph that'll be available through the site. Um, that'll be certain little certificate and everything that goes with it. And most importantly, whatever it is that you donate goes to help our programs. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful piece of work and a great cause. Thank you. Well, we can go on and on and on, but uh, we are very limited, and uh, I know for you to get up at this hour, I, we pre I appreciate it. So we, we know uh, a La couple things for certain. Da. Right. Life goes on, bro. Exactly. <laughs> he woke up, he got out of bed, he dragged the comb across his head. Yeah. So we know a couple things for certain. We've got the Individualist Tour, which uh, kicks off in April, uh, Europe, uh, North America, Japan. Uh, we know that you're going to be back out on the road in the summer. We've got this uh, experience that's going to go down in Amsterdam. And uh, we know that when LL Cool J gets inducted into the Rock Hall, you're going to do the speech on his behalf. So, all right. <laughs> Todd Rogan, everybody. Thank you. Right. 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 Right.